says that she loves me Isn't it lovely when the one who loves me is the one who loves me? Uh, Charles Coleman Jr. is here, one amazing person, and we are joined by journalist and author, 54 books. Some of y'all know Let the Church Say Amen. That's probably most, one of the most famous ones that mm. I like. I like that one. Uh, the Secret She Kept. You you do some, you used to do some salacious stuff. This is a historical novel, which I love. I love. It's the story of Hattie McDaniel, fictionalized by the great Rashonda Tate. She is here today. Hello. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. Listen, listen, um, you know, I write, but you write, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's, there's levels to this, y'all. 54 books. Come on now. This is, yes, this is, this is something. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have a line for teenagers. So that includes all of those books. Yeah. And it's, not, it's not like I've well, written 54 you, adult But you novels. act like, you act like, well, I actually think writing for teens is harder it because is. it requires more imagination, more depth, depth. Writing wise, like to me, I, I love young adult books because the writing is so much richer. Right. Yeah. And you have to reach them. You have to be able to reach yes. them. And that takes a yes. special skill. That's right. So what brought you to Hattie McDaniel and how, how do you fictionalize her life and why? You know, historical fiction really is, as a journalist, it's, it's the merging of both world, the best of both worlds for me, because as a journalist, I'm able to lay the foundation and the foundation are the facts of her life. And then the novelist side of me can come in and sprinkle in that fiction to fill in the blanks. And so I have this affinity for her and I was able to tell her story and then use the fiction part to fill in the things we don't know. Mm -hmm. So coming in, um, we know her as the first black woman to win an Oscar for playing Mammy in Gone with the Wind. Uh, powerful, powerful figure. The little bit that I know is that uh, Clark Gable had to fight for her to even be at the uh, restaurant where they held the, uh, the uh, Academy Awards. She sat, sat at the back near the kitchen. She had to sit at the back. They would not let her with the rest of the cast. I mean, you think about somebody nominated for an Oscar not allowed to sit in the front of the building and not allowed to be in the house at first and yes. so that you know that's that's what fascinated me about it her the producer of gone with the wind had to fight i mean he had to pull tooth and nail to get her uh, to be allowed at the event and they finally did let her in but she was all the way in the back by the kitchen in fact by the time when she won her award by the time she made it to the stage the music had stopped playing that's how far back she was wow when you have a when, okay. when you have a work like this, and it is historical fiction, um, what is it that you want the reader to take away about the subject? Is it greater interest in the subject? Is it shaping how the reader sort of perceives the person uh, overall? And 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 how do you sort of avoid the notion of not romanticizing who they were? And Hattie McDaniel's case, I think it's easy to do, but I think there are there are examples of historical fiction, especially in today's world, where we run the risk of romanticizing the legacy or the events around certain people in a way that's dangerous to the actual historical narrative. And yeah, so I really did stay true um, to all the major events in her life uh, are, are all fact. Those are that's the foundation of the story. And I stuck to that. And that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And some mm -hmm. of the, the issues that Hattie McDaniel had, she brought on herself at her own frustration. Mm -hmm. Because I, what I didn't know, and what a lot of people didn't know as I'm touring the country with this book, is that Hattie McDaniel was hated by Blacks and whites. So white people hated her because they felt like Mammy was too sassy. Black people hated her because they felt she was then having this demeaning stereotype. And she just wanted to act. She wanted to walk this fine line of, of acting, but she was not accepted in either world. And so it really took a toll on her. And sometimes she made some decisions that weren't for the best. And I, I show all of that throughout the book. Give us one of those. We're talking with Rashonda Tate, the author of The Queen of Sugar Hill, which is a novel of Hattie McDaniel, uh, who could not come to that event because it was a segregated segregated hotel, black people were not allowed. I mean, <laughs> stuff just needs to make sense to me. So, what what were they afraid of? Like letting blacks come to the hotel would do what exactly? Like, what, you what know, would happen? 
this is 1940. So they they were not trying to mix and mingle with, with Black people. And in fact, even though they had gotten permission for her to come to the Academy Awards, when she entered that night, security wouldn't let her in. And so they had to go find the people that, you know, the organizers who said, okay, it's okay, you can let her in. But she kept her head held high. She said, she recognized I'm in the house. There's never right. been anybody here except janitors and wait staff. And I'm here as a guest. We, we were having a, a Grammys conversation. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, Charles. Uh, like we were having a conversation about the importance of, you know, well, if they don't want us here, we should, no, we, we deserve to be everywhere. We deserve to be everywhere. But as, as you're talking, I'm also thinking you, you had your baby suckle at the breasts of black women. The rape of black women was so prevalent that I'm sitting here with coffee or lay skin. It was so prevalent. It's so prevalent that nobody in this Zoom right now is is African black, right? So prevalent. So so our bodies were good enough for you to uh, produce more babies with. Our bodies were good enough to suckle your babies. The milk was pure enough to nourish your to take care of your home to feed you to empty your chamber pot to build your country but we couldn't come into a hotel because mingling with us meant what exactly i like i it, none of it make it doesn't make any logical sense if i could suckle your baby which is the most precious thing i think right mm -hmm. how does and, you and, and you know, that? that's all part of, of this whole journey through history is you're looking at these people that felt she was less than. And I capture that in this book. She's like, I'm here. You might not want me here. And they didn't because I, it was still Hollywood, but it was still 1940 and it was just as bad as the South. A lot of people didn't realize that. And so the, she was like, you may not want me here, but I'm here. I have a seat at the table. The table may be in the back of the room, but I have a seat at the table. And like it or not, I'm here. She now afterwards, after the Academy Award, um, all of the the um, nominees from uh, and winners from Gone with the Wind went out to a club, and they would not allow Hattie McDaniel in the club. So they're all the entourage is going in. The the um, club owner is excited, and he's like, everybody can come in except her. And so she was faced with this kind of thing constantly. And meanwhile, the black people over here laughing at her because they're like, you thought you were one of them. I think that I think that part of the discomfort that folks during that era sought to avoid by excluding us from spaces was the reminder of how much they tampered with our own humanity. The the reminder constantly of you know this is another human being. And you know that you have not treated this person as another human being. You don't want to be reminded of that because it makes you uncomfortable. And so it's better to just keep you away from this space than it is to allow you to be here. And on a night when in my revelry of celebration of this honor and these awards that are being given out to this very exclusive space of Hollywood that we all know Generally speaking, you have been, you, you know, it's a miracle that you're even here. But you're here because you paid a, you played a, a maid and a servant. But it's still a miracle that you're even here. On a night when we're celebrating that, I don't want to be reminded of that. On a night when I'm going out to a club to enjoy myself and to party, I don't want to be reminded of that because it makes me uncomfortable. So, Karen, when you ask the question, and I know you know, but when you ask the question like, well, what was that going to do? It allows you to buy into the reality or the myth of like out of sight, out of mind. I don't have to act as though these people exist. I don't have to deal with or wrestle with the complex questions of how I may be complicit, if not altogether actively subjugating their humanity if they're not in the room with me. Because I ain't got to think about it. Or, or maybe I'm wrong. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have to get to the of that. So yeah. if, if I have to be, which is why I'm always challenging, you know, Mammy's Coons, what's it, Donald Bogle's book? You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm always challenging and at the same time leaning fully into some stereotypes so that now you would be forced to have to reckon with, ooh, um, somebody talking like you is supposed to be ignorant, but yet I cannot battle you uh, intellectually 
What does that mean? Somebody right. showing up in a hoodie who looks like you, Charles, actually has a law degree. Well, you're supposed to be a, a you know, common thug. What does that mean? Uh, you know, I want to clutch my purse when you get in the elevator. But, you know, I was somewhere yesterday. I was like, I will buy this place. Like, I'm that person. I, I That's why I'm like, <laughs> God already knows. Like, I will come in and do that whole, you know, everybody's fired. You want to mistreat somebody? Matter of fact, no problem. You're relieved of your duties. But that that kind of thing is um, that discomfort that you're talking about. They It's like they know, though, but they don't want it in their face. So you, you run into a, a, a Rashonda Tate on the street, you, you're going to get all of your ass handed to you <laughs> intellectually. And I, I love this because we, and this is why I, I challenge everyone to show up as their full selves. Let's stop code switching. Let's stop making them, making them comfortable with how we, you know, have the dulcet tones. And I'm not saying you come in and bust, you know, bust in the door and act all crazy, but like being our full self is, is what we owe to ourselves, but we also owe it to the people who have judged us. They need to see us in all the different, we say we're not a monolith. We'll show it. Yeah. Why do we look the same and sound the same in every place that, you know, they are? And, and it's important that we be vocal. So I'm in this um, Facebook group, Gone with the Wind Lovers, because, you know, I, I joined it because I want to get in there and talk about this. And we uh, we have had this discussion that's going on. It's like 40,000 people in this group. Of course, you know, they're predominantly 38,990 of them are white. And they are having this discussion and they love Mammy. And they're like, well, I don't understand why you didn't like her when, when you were growing up. And I said, because I'm a young woman of color and I wanted to see young, uh, black women on TV doing something other than being a maid. And they don't, they didn't, they were saying they don't get that. They don't understand. And they argued with me how I should have been colorblind. And I said, you have the luxury of being colorblind. You have the luxury of, of saying, I don't see color. I don't have that luxury. Hattie McDaniel didn't have that luxury. Well, I will go even further to say when, you know, when people say I don't see color, what they're doing is they're letting you know how lazy they are. And what I mean by that is seeing color is requiring you to see differences. And that means you got to do some work because now when I bring you to the place that you now see the difference, the question becomes, what are you going to do about it? When you say I don't see color, what you're saying is, oh, I, I don't have to be bothered with any of that because I'm exempt. I tested out of that class. So what they're really telling you is that I am not interested in doing the work necessary. So I completely agree with you in terms of how much of a privilege that is. And it must be fantastic, but it's also something that's very disconcerting. And they're not, it, it's one of those things where it's like, I know you think that this sounds really evolved and like very progressive, it's none of the above. Like it's absolutely the, the exact opposite. That's Charles Coleman Jr. We're talking with Rashonda Tate, the author of 54 books, including the latest, The Queen of Sugar Hill, which is a historical fiction. Uh, so beautifully done. As you were talking about Hattie McDaniel doing some things, I can imagine the frustration of being a trained, not just a trained actor, singer, uh, intelligent, like she's, she was also, you know, studied, you know what I'm saying? She wasn't a, a, an enslaved person or, or maid. She had, she was brilliant and then relegated to this and then hated. Give us an example of something that you, you said she did. She at her own, you know, doing out of her frustration. Give us an example. So the NAACP waged an all out war against Hattie McDaniel and actors like her. And mm -hmm. that was a stunning part of my research because I, I researched for this for three years. They were well-meaning. Walter White was the executive director and they were well-meaning. They just wanted better portrayals of African-Americans, but they did it at the expense of Hattie McDaniel. And there was a, an incident, a 1942 uh, NAACP national convention where they invited Hattie McDaniel. And she thought, you know, I'm about to be honored. And instead they brought Lena Horne on stage and said, this is the example that we want Hollywood to see. This is the standard of beauty we want Hollywood to see, not Hattie McDaniel's mammy. So she's sitting in the audience having to, to take this in. Now, you know, we would like to think that Hattie was all just, she always took the high road, but sometimes you that is enough to make anybody mad. And she would go home and she would write these scathing letters that didn't ended up getting her in more trouble. But it's understandable because how much can you be beat down without eventually fighting back? Amen. 
Um, I'm just buying your book, and there's only um, five copies left. So... <laughs> It Girl, is number very, one, come yeah. on through. I'm still stuck, on, on, I'm still stuck on 54. Lord, that is amazing. <laughs> that is, that is phenomenal. Ah, oh, man. I, I, so, uh, because this is so phenomenal, um, what, I don't want to, I don't want to ask you such a, like, a, a basic question as what your process is, but you said you spent three years researching this book. Were you in the middle of another work while you were doing that? Or was it just, I'm completely dedicated to knocking this out? So I had just had another book come out, my last book. And I, when I started working on this, so, but I've, I've completely, you can't, it's, it's so much research. And in the process of this, I discovered the internet is completely, probably the seventy percent of the stuff on the internet is wrong. wrong. Yes, and so I I was dumbfounded from Wikipedia to articles, and so I had to go beyond the internet for research. Uh, if you Google right now, um, it will talk about Hattie McDaniel's husband George Langford and how he died in a gambling match. Hattie didn't have a husband named George Langford. There was no gambling. So somebody wrote that somewhere and everybody started repeating it. So I had to go. I did went to California and went to a research library and I spent weeks there doing research and census records. So in this particular book, that's all I could work on with in terms of writing. Now, I still have a day job. I'm a managing editor for a black newspaper here in Houston. But I'm able to do everything because I believe every minute you spend talking about what you don't have time to do could be spent doing it. Come on. And so that's what I do. My approach. Amen. 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 All right. We have limited time. I want to get Marsha in Texas. She wanted to say hello to you. Marsha in Texas is on. Rashonda Tate is here. Charles Coleman Jr. Hey, Marsha. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Thank you for taking my call. I'm a first time caller. Yay! I want to thank you for <laughs> thank you for all that you do in those new Nubian streets as well as on your show. You. And I just wanted to say hi to Rashonda. I hadn't heard from her in a while but but back in the day she went to haiti with us on a mission trip oh wow and i heard, heard her on your show and i just wanted to say hi roshanda well hello marcia yes that was a that was an eye-opening experience a memorable one that trip to haiti i want to hear more about that um as haiti is embroiled in some things yeah. right now we we have so many things happening geopolitically but we have to stay connected and i'm glad that marcia heard you and wanted to reconnect. Um, as I look at the time, I, I need more time with you, Miss Miss Tate. I need yeah. more time. I need to talk about what's going on in Texas. Oh, but man, Oof. I I forgot that you were in Texas yeah. just now. I was like, oh my god. Okay, will you come back? Because I, I, would I need love journalistically, to. <laughs> I need to know how you're covering this border situation. Yes, absolutely. Would love to talk about that. Smiths make it happen. Smiths make it happen. And I'm, I, I just bought my book too. So uh, people always sending me books, but I need to support. Um, well, I and, sure appreciate and it. It matters. <laughs> it matters. Let me say thank you so much. Congratulations. The Queen of Sugar Hill. Get it. Get it. Get it. Get thank it. Get it. Uh, and let me say thank you to Charles Coleman Jr. And check out uh, Black Men in America on Peacock. Thank you for being here and him on MSNBC. <laughs> Says that she loves me. Isn't it lovely when the one who loves thinks? 